Hey, deserving listeners. Today, I'm going to talk about the most accurately portrayed DSM disorders in characters in movies. This was actually suggested as a top 11 list by patron Malika uh, during our 11th anniversary show earlier this year. We asked for a bunch of people to submit different top 11 lists that they wanted us to do. And this is one of them. And there were so many good ones that some of them got left on the cutting room floor. And so I just thought I would do some of those now. These movies are in no particular order. And I actually couldn't come up with 11. I could only come up with, I don't know, eight or nine or something. Because there's so few movies and TV shows that depict mental illness. So there's two things I'm looking for. One, do they portray it accurately? And two, do they give us enough detail that actually tells us that the character actually has that disorder. Because like in Iron Man 3, for example, we have Tony Stark who exhibits some PTSD symptoms, but the movie, probably for a good reason, doesn't really go into detail about his symptoms because that's, you know, it's trying to, Iron Man 3 is a superhero movie. It's supposed to be PG-13 and light and um, fun, but, you know, with a twist of psychological issues that the character has. Um, So, you know, it makes sense that they wouldn't go into detail. So I'm looking for, is it accurate? And is there enough information so that we can be like, yep, this person actually does have this disorder. So in no particular order, I'll start with uh, There Will Be Blood. This is perhaps one of the only movies that depicts narcissistic personality disorder accurately. I did actually a whole episode on this, and if you want to listen to that, you can listen to that, uh, where I broke down all the different movies that claim to be good depictions of narcissism. And There Will Be Blood is perhaps the only movie I can think of, aside from my next movie, which is The Talented Mr. Ripley. These two movies in conjunction show two different sides or two different types main types of narcissistic personality disorder. The talented Mr. Ripley, you could say there's a touch of borderline. Narcissism and borderline are actually very similar according to my conceptualization of it. And, uh, but the problem with these movies, as with a lot of these movies that I'm gonna talk about, they have to have some kind of storyline, some kind of plot. And one of the most, you know, favorite tropes of movies and TV show plot writers is to have murder and death. And There Will Be Blood and The Talented Mr. Ripley have murder in it. These main characters who, uh, you know, could be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder are murderous. So that's something that also is a problem because the vast, vast majority of people with narcissistic personality disorder and borderline don't kill anyone. I would venture to say that the rates of killing among those who have those kinds of personality disorders are probably similar to people who don't have personality disorders. And because of this portrayal, this trope that is used in movies and TV, there are people in our society, a good number of them, who associate narcissistic personality disorder with murder, with killing. I, I think I just got an email from someone today or yesterday, last night, maybe, they were saying, um, I can't remember what the question was, but basically it was implying that they believed that narcissistic personality disorder people, you know, why do they kill, you know, sort of a question like that. I can't remember. Anyway, my first response to that person was, you realize narcissistic personality disorder people are not murderers any more so than anyone else. Uh, As a clinician who treats people with personality disorders, I'm here to tell you, uh, they don't want to kill anyone just like other people don't want to kill anyone. Um, So so these movies, There Will Be Blood, Talon and Mr. Ripley, although they give us enough information so that we can, because they're very focused on their characters, they give us enough information to be able to diagnose them And they seem to be fairly accurate. Now, are they quintessential? No. And also, they kill people, which isn't, you know, very common. The next movie that I want to talk about is To the Bone, which is a Netflix movie that came out a couple years ago, I think. And it portrays anorexia in the main character. It's mostly accurate. Uh, A lot of movies have tried to depict eating disorders. But To the Bone 
really goes for it because that's the whole point of this. It's someone who is suffering from anorexia and is slowly um, sort of descending into symptoms. It's getting worse and worse and worse. She goes into treatment. She goes into a group home for treatment. There are other people with eating disorders in group therapy. So you see the different you know sorts of people who might have an eating disorder. The other problem with movies is that you have to cram everything into a short amount of time. To really understand anorexia, you'd have to live with someone or treat someone for a long time. That's something that I learned, actually. When I went to graduate school and learned about anorexia along with all of my fellow grad students, I learned about the symptoms. I, saw, I read some vignettes. I saw some videos. And then the next week, we just moved on to a different disorder. And when I started treating people with eating disorders, I felt like I kind of understood it. But the more and more I learned about it and the more I, I started treating people with it, the more I realized, wow, this is way more complicated than one could possibly encapsulate in a course or in the DSM. Eating disorders are extremely complex. There are certain DSM diagnoses that are pretty straightforward. Panic disorder, generalized anxiety, major depression. These are pretty easy to understand. Anorexia and certainly personality disorders are very complicated. But to the bone, I think they did a pretty good job. And I have experts in eating disorders, colleagues of mine who also appreciated it. There, there are problems, um, of course. But like I said, you know, as far as things go, it's pretty good. And the this movie doesn't have things like, and then her anorexia caused her to murder a bunch of people. Like, there's nothing like that. It, it just, it's just a story about someone as they become more and more symptomatic and how they are trying to find themselves in that process. The next movie is Flight with um, Denzel Washington playing someone with substance use disorder or alcoholism, as is generally called. In this movie, Flight, which I found to be just a gem of a movie, not only is it interesting because it has that whole flight scene of that's really famous where he turns the plane upside down, but the rest of the movie is pretty much about him and his alcoholism. And you really get a sense in this movie how powerless people are over their addictions. There's this point in the movie where you think like, okay, he, he finally realized he's hit bottom so many different times. He's, he's trying to be clean and sober. He realizes, you know, his trial is the next day. He realizes he needs to be sober. And, you know, he's doing all these different things to make sure he doesn't drink. And, and then he, you know, this, you're just seeing this, it's all nonverbal. It's all this, it's the scene that's shot in a hotel room. And just when you think, okay, he overcame the temptation, boom, he gives into it and boom, he's drunk all night long and boom, he ends up going to the trial intoxicated. And then boom, he starts talking about it. He's in the hearing and he's like, and by the way, I'm drunk right now. And it's this powerful, just, you know, cringing. I mean, that's what it's like to live with an addiction is it's so hard to control and this notion that, you know, if you just have willpower, you'll be able to overcome it. And it also portrays alcoholism in this really accurate way in that his life isn't completely going down the tubes. Most people who suffer, the vast majority of people who suffer from addictions, their lives are pretty much functional. I treated heroin addicts for a while and found that uh, there were some whose lives were a little bit on the rocks. But most of my clients in Seattle, heroin's kind of a problem in Seattle. And but Seattle also has this, you know, booming economy, all these different, you know, internet-y kind of things that I don't understand. And a lot of these young people have these jobs, yet they're using heroin or there are other opiates, opioids. And they have their, you know, they're doing good. They're still talking to their parents. They they might have a spouse, they might have kids, everything's functioning, and yet they're uh, they're powerless over their addictions. And it's just, uh, you know, heartbreaking to, to see people, um, you know, continue to use in the face of just consequence after consequence after consequence. Now, I'm not saying that people who use heroin in the long term 
um, are always functional. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that this movie Flight shows um, that tension between, uh, you know, holding on to one's sort of regular life and then also just struggling in isolation and in shame and behind closed doors with something that's just really awful. The next movie is Shine. This came out a, a while ago, and I, it's, I, I saw it when it came out in the theater. I think I might have seen it with my dad, actually, and when I was in my 20s, I think. Um, it's a movie presumably about schizoaffective disorder. I don't remember it that well, but from my memory, it was a good depiction of what that disorder is like. I don't know if it gives enough information to really show what the disorder is like, but I, I remember certain scenes that pop out in my head when he starts, you know, when he first starts to break from reality and how, um, how it might feel to be in someone's shoes like that. Um, the next two movies are about schizophrenia, A Beautiful Mind and The Soloist. A Beautiful Mind, so again, The Soloist and The Beautiful Mind, these are movies that are trying to tell a story about um, a person. They're not trying to tell a story about schizophrenia. They're not trying to educate the audience about schizophrenia. And so a lot of details are left out and they, they don't fully explain. It's not like you can watch A Beautiful Mind and go, oh, I understand what schizophrenia is now because it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot of different presentations, blah, blah, blah. But from my memory, both these movies, particularly A Beautiful Mind from my memory, they're not bad depictions of what schizophrenia actually is like. They take shortcuts like... Um, you know, in order to tell a story of hallucinations, it's, it's, you kind of have, it, that's, you know, it's, it, it would be impossible to depict what uh, hallucinations actually feel like. In movies, they, they tend to just, you know, like in Beautiful Mind, uh, Russell Crowe's character, uh, John Nash, I think is his, the real guy's name, He's, he um, hallucinates this guy. Um, he just hallucinates a friend, like his friends, he's having conversations with his friend. And although that's in, in the direction of what uh, schizophrenic people will describe, it's not exactly accurate. So, you know, it's a movie you're trying to make an entertainment sort of thing. And But uh, Beautiful Mind and The Soloist, I remember being like, okay, you know, they gave us enough information and I could see something like this happening. The next movie is The Aviator with... Leonardo DiCaprio depicting obsessive compulsive disorder. This movie really shows you how horrible the disorder is. Maybe it's because it's about a real person that they, you know, kept it honest or something. But you really get the sense of how how compulsive the disorder is and and how you slowly descend into isolation and a lot of odd ideas. Now, they didn't give us a lot of background into what was going through Howard Hughes's mind at the time. They just showed us uh, the, the style of the movie was they, they showed us OCD, what it looked like kind of from the outside. So you wouldn't walk away from the aviator saying like, I understand what OCD is. But in terms of a lot of the depictions of OCD, the aviator is, is you know, one of the better ones. A lot of movies will show OCD TV shows as well, like um, Monk, and there are a lot of corners that they cut and inaccuracies that they sprinkle in because they're, again, they're trying to make something entertaining, like as good as it gets with Jack Nicholson. Uh, it, presumably people talk about that, or people talk about this as like, oh, it's a great movie about OCD. There are problems with that movie. If, if, if you actually have OCD or you actually treat OCD, as I do at times, and you watch As Good As It Gets, you're just like, wait, what? Like, one of the things about As Good As It Gets is, I think that's the name of the movie with Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt. Helen Hunt? <laughs> um, I'm trying to do this off, off the top of my head. But anyway, Jack Nicholson presumably has OCD, and they start off the movie kind of showing it, but they also equate OCD with just being kind of like a grumpy old man, which is not not the same thing. Now, you could argue it's just like, well, we were trying to portray a grumpy old man with that who, who has OCD. It's like, okay, fine. But in the end, what ends up, quote unquote, he's going to therapy, he's getting medication, nothing's really helping. And in the end, what helps him is he falls in love with this young, very young woman, by the way, who, you know, we'll, look over, we'll overlook that for a second. But anyway, he falls in love and he allows her into his life. 
And that's what cures him of his OCD is essentially what the movie is about, which is fucking ridiculous. The next movie is Still Alice with, um, God, what's her name? Uh, Julie, anyway, uh, it uh, portrays Alzheimer's, and dementia, and memory loss. This movie, that's the whole point of this movie is showing how this middle-aged woman has early onset Alzheimer's and how she slowly starts to forget things. She slowly becomes less functional in life. Uh, her The grief she experiences in that process, the, the way her family reacts to it, the way you would sort of emotionally deal with it at the beginning of the discovery for yourself. It's like, whoa, really? I have early onset Alzheimer's and in five years, I'm not going to, I'm not going to know who my own children are. And in seven years, I'll be dead. You know, like, oh my God, it, it's, it's something that is very familiar to a lot of people, particularly people who are with their elderly parents or grandparents or a relative of some, or a loved one. And the rest of the world completely ignores this. It's something that is um, very much a part of our, um, you know, human experience, particularly today as we have technologies that allow people to live a lot longer than they used to. And yet hardly any movies about it. Still Alice um, is, a, is just a wonderful depiction of that. Are there problems? Yes. But I, I think overall it, it's a good movie. So yeah, as I said, I couldn't come up with any other movies that now I'm sure they're out there, but um, I looked online, different lists that people made and there's a lot of lists of, of movies and I've seen a lot of movies. I haven't obviously seen them all. But I, I can tell you that as a therapist, I've been, you know, in the field for almost 25 years or 25 years. And whenever I see anything mental health related, counseling related in movies, I always take note of it. I'm always evaluating it as a professional. And I would remember if I saw a movie that actually was an accurate depiction there are movies that are listed on the internet that are often cited as these excellent examples of disorders in the DSM, but in my opinion, they're not. Like Girl Interrupted, uh, this is supposed to be a wonderful depiction of borderline personality disorder. It's been a while since I've seen the movie, but I remember thinking, no, 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 this is not borderline. Uh, this is someone who is suffering quite a bit and feels quite isolated, but it doesn't look like borderline at all to me. So, uh, so yeah, Girl Interrupted from my memory wasn't accurate. The Sopranos uh, TV show tries to portray a number of things. Uh, one of Tony's mistresses uh, uh, apparently has borderline. She was the one who uh, was the Mercedes uh, dealership saleswoman. It's not a terrible depiction of borderline, but it's very brief. There's not a lot of detail and it's a little sensational. So I, I wouldn't point people to that as a good example of borderline. I actually can't think of any movie that portrays borderline well, honestly. Uh, Silver Linings Playbook, J Jennifer Lawrence is supposed to have borderline in that. Bradley Cooper is supposed to have bipolar in that. And although there's a scene with Bradley Cooper in the beginning of the movie where it it looks like a manic episode and it it's, you know, it, you're like, oh, is that what mania looks like? And you're like, yeah, it can look like that. Again, Silver Linings Playbook is trying to be an entertaining movie. It's not trying to educate people about borderline and bipolar. And they don't really show us the full breadth of the symptoms, which again makes sense because it's, it's not an educational movie. It's an entertainment movie. And the problem with this movie is, so the, you know, someone with borderline falls in someone with bipolar and Bradley Cooper and J-Law. And by the end of the movie, they're in this dance scene together. Uh, I enjoyed the movie for sure. But at the end of the movie, I was like, wait a second. So we're just supposed to believe that these two people just ride off in the sunset happily ever after. Uh, that's not how this usually plays out. If you, if you have someone who legit has borderline and someone who legit has bipolar, there's going to be a lot of bumps in the road after that. And they just made it seem like if, if someone with borderline and someone with bipolar if they just really believe in love and they just try to do this dance together and, you know, and, and they try to capture the goodness of life, then that'll just solve all their problems. Again, they're not explicitly saying that, but it, it just, 
as a clinician watching it, I just thought, uh, well, that's not accurate. <laughs> like, if that's all, I mean, believe me, as someone who treats people, I specialize in borderline. Uh, if it if if it was just that simple, you know, like, hey, go find a a dance partner, fall in love, and you know, really try to capture life and and do you know, have, look on the bright side and done it. If that's all it took, like, come on. Um, there's a lot of movies online where they talk about like, oh, you know, if you really want to see what mental illness is like, you got to watch Psycho or American Psycho or Silence of the Lambs or Fatal Attraction. And although one could argue that these movies depict psychopathy or any social or sadism or something, it's like, okay, fine. But these, if we're going to look to those movies as like examples of how to teach the public or clinicians about mental illnesses, then my God, you know, uh, it, it, we're just furthering that connection, that false connection, that false association between mental illness and murdering people. So, and it's actually kind of a trope of, of screenwriters is to make your villain have a mental illness, which isn't helping. So it, yeah, there's a, again, there's a lot of other movies that people identify. And if you want to let me know about any particular movie that you think depicts um, men mental illnesses or disorders in the DSM, then let me know. My guess is, is that if it's a popular one, so if there's any popular movies out there where you're like, well, surely Kirk has seen this movie or he's heard of it, why isn't he talking about that? It's probably because, one, it wasn't accurate. Two, it didn't give enough information to really portray the disorder well enough so that I, as a watcher, would go, okay, yeah, I, I could see how that person has that disorder. Or three, it, does, it doesn't stigmatize the disorder in a really inaccurate way. So those are the, those are the three criteria I'm looking for, I guess. Um, so if, if, in, think about that before you uh, identify a movie. I mean, you might have a movie like, oh, this movie I think really depicts this really well. Or this movie was shown to me in, in my graduate school courses is a good example of this. Again, think, is it really accurate? Two, does it really give you enough information? And three, does it stigmatize the disorder in an unnecessary way? Um, because these other movies, There Will Be Blood, Talented Mr. Ripley, they stigmatize. So, we'll, But I think they're an example of what it's like to live either next to someone with narcissism or be in the shoes of someone with narcissism. Uh, to the Bone, Flight, Shine, A Beautiful Mind, The Soloist, The Aviator, and Still Alice. These movies, in my book, don't really stigmatize disorders. They, sh they give enough information, and, and it, it's mostly accurate. But the thing to remember is that uh, if you're a layperson, watching these movies will not teach you what these disorders are. It'd be like watching a movie about cancer and you know how to diagnose it and how to treat it or something. You wouldn't claim after watching a movie about cancer and cancer treatment that you could identify cancer and treat it, right? Well, it's the same when it comes to these complicated disorders, such as anorexia or particularly uh, personality disorder, schizoaffective, schizophrenia for the most part, even OCD. These are things that you have to be a clinician who specializes in that. For example, for me, I have very rarely treated someone with psychosis. Uh, people, I, I don't think I've ever had someone with schizoaffective. I've had a few people with schizophrenia, and I had very brief experiences with them. I've never worked in an inpatient a psychiatric ward. I've never, um, you know, worked with quote unquote seriously mentally ill people, and so. For me, even though I've been working in the field for 25 years and I have a doctorate and two masters and I teach people about psychopathology and I supervise people and technically I can diagnose someone with, with schizophrenia, if I came across someone whom I thought had schizophrenia, I would consult with an expert who knew about schizophrenia because I recognize myself, I don't know that much about it. I specialize in personality disorders and I, for a time, specialized in eating disorders. I don't anymore because I found that treating eating disorders required, to some, it depends, but in my opinion, to be a really effective eating disorder clinician, 
you have to kind of be on call, maybe not 24 seven, but you have to treat clients, but you have to have safety plans between sessions. And, and although I did that for a while, once I became a professor full time, I just didn't have the time for that. And I felt like I was being irresponsible. So I stopped specializing in, in eating disorders. But anyway, there are many clinicians out there who don't specialize in personality disorders, who don't specialize in eating disorders, and they also do not understand those disorders. So even other clinicians don't really understand some sections, if not many sections in the DSM, and that's fine, that's normal. So for lay people to think that they would just understand something. Now, if you have the disorder or you had a brother or a spouse with the disorder, then you probably have a good bead on that on that particular disorder, or at least that particular presentation of that disorder. So I just I just want to point that out. I'm not trying to beat people up, but I'm just trying to make sure that people understand the landscape, because the internet seems to think that if you watch a couple of YouTube videos and maybe you read you know the Mayo Clinic website, suddenly you understand a certain disorder. And the fact is is uh, you probably don't. One of the things that I often hear from students, and I actually went through this kind of myself, it's sort of a cliche, is that graduate students in mental health, when they take psychopathology, suddenly they start diagnosing themselves with everything in the DSM. It's, it's a joke. It's sort of an inside joke that graduate students will make and teachers will make about graduate students sometimes. And part of the reason why that is, is because a little bit of information is, is dangerous because you learn a little bit and you're like, whoa, you feel like you understand it and you start applying it all over the place when in fact you actually don't understand it well. Taking psych, I mean, just to give you a clue, just to give you an idea, and I've talked about this before, most people who graduate with a doctorate in clinical psychology or a master's in some you know, clinical mental health uh, discipline, marriage and family therapy, counseling, social work, they will have taken maybe two classes on psychopathology, maybe more, but probably not. And now psychologists tend to take more in assessment and whatnot. So they get a little bit better education on, on psychopathology, depending on who they're supervising, who they're taught. But in general, a lot of people have only taken one to three classes on average. And when you try to cram, and so just to give you an idea how the students in my uh, program are taught, we uh, it's a master's program there. They have two courses. We're on quarter system. So they get six months of education on psychopathology. For the first three months, every week, they're taught about a different chapter in the DSM, essentially. So one week, they learn about all the anxiety disorders. Another week, they learn about all the mood disorders. And the next week, they learn about all the psychotic disorders. And the next week, it's all the, you know, sexual disorders. And, you know, and so, so in the week that you have to learn all the eating disorders, you're, you, you probably spend three hours reading stuff about eating disorders, anorexia just being one of them. And then you, you hear a lecture for a couple hours about eating disorders, and then you're done. And then the next three months, you spend time thinking about how to treat, how to write treatment plans for this, th those disorders. And that's, that sort of assumes you already understand the disorder and doesn't really, it furthers it a little bit because it's, you know, it's like, okay, now that you can assess someone, how do you, how do you exactly treat it? And how do you write up the treatment plan? That's it. So for a lot of people, when they graduate and, and they, they're working with people or even at internship before they graduate, they will have had a total of probably like two hours, if, you know, just for anorexia alone, they will have probably had a total of one to three hours of reading and lecture and thinking time about anorexia in and of itself on a good day. And that's because anorexia is actually focused on. There are whole sections of the DSM that are usually ignored in these classes. And, and that is not enough time. And the person's a clinician. So the key is, is that you have to have supervisors that help you. You have to, cons in the first 10, 20 years of your career, you have to have experts whom you consult with. For me, learning about borderline, for example, I, you know, that's how I learned. I had that one week on all the personality disorders. And I learned a little bit about borderline. Uh, really had no idea how to identify it. I just remember just being like, uh, I still don't get this stuff because how could you? It's too complicated. 
then at my internship I or early career, I had someone who had borderline personality disorder. The client didn't know she had borderline. I slowly started to realize as I got to know her over months, I was like, I, maybe this is what borderline is. And I would consult with experts and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, well, look at the, this, think about this. How, what's your countertransference? How does it feel? And then eventually I was like, oh, I think I finally understand what borderline is. Now I understood what it was just for that one person. I can't know it for everyone, but I knew what it was for that one person. It wasn't in, it wasn't until, I don't know, a couple years after I graduated, maybe, maybe earlier than that, but it took a long time, many hours of actual contact with someone with borderline, many hours of actually treating them before I finally got, oh, I think I understand borderline. Now, uh, 20 years later, when I look back at myself in my early career, I will say I barely understood borderline. I understood it well enough to treat it, but my experience with borderline since then has been enormous and many hours treating it and many hours thinking about myself in relation to borderline in terms of we all have the potential to be borderline on the inside of us. We all have, we're all on the spectrum on, you know, to some extent we can all become mildly borderline under stress and then experiencing that in people in my personal life. I now understand borderline forwards and backwards. So, so, my point is, is that when you think about watching a movie and you're like, I now understand this disorder, it's probably more complicated than that. All right, let's take a break. And when we get back, I will answer a patron email. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron, do so now. Go to patreon.com. All of our best episodes are only available for patrons. Sorry about that, non-patrons, but there's an easy, easy solution to that. Just become a patron. Also, I just want to remind everyone that when you become a patron, a certain amount of your money goes towards various philanthropic efforts that we do on the podcast. We've given away over $10,000 to various different charities that we support. Uh, we've given, I don't know, four to $5,000 in scholarships directly to students who are making the world a better place, uh, LGBTQ um, charities, animal charities, homelessness charities. And so know that when you give to the podcast, you're giving to the community as well. And not to put a sort of grandiose point on it, but I would like to think that this podcast also puts forth a lot of ideas that I think need to be presented on the internet. I'm not the only one, of course, but there's a lot of ideas on the internet that are underrepresented. Uh, just one, you know, uh, hearkening back to what I was talking about earlier, hearkening um, of borderline, the idea or narcissism or any personality disorder for that matter, it is normal for people on the internet to believe that people with borderline are raving lunatics and people with narcissism are murderous psychopaths. And these are destructive notions because if we're going to help all the people with personality disorders, we have to think about the way that we uh, communicate to the public. And if people are walking around thinking these false notions, then it's going to be hard for them to get help for it, you know? Um, like along those lines, sometimes people ask me, so if you have a client with borderline, do you tell them that they have borderline? And what I say is, well, maybe. But what I tell them is, do not Google it because everything on the internet is false. So let me tell you what borderline really is. When you're relationally traumatized, you're traumatized. And when that trauma is triggered, you're going to have tremendous anxiety. And that is going to result in you being the most scared person on the planet. And when you get really, when anyone gets really scared, then they, they get desperate. And they're going to do a lot of different things to try to alleviate that fear. Uh, they might isolate. They might want to kill themselves. They might drink a lot. They might have, um, you know, they might reach out sexually to other people to hold on to other people and their attachments. They might get angry. They might even stalk their, um, you know, their, they, they might be dating someone. They get, someone dumps them and they're very, very hurt. All that trauma is triggered and they, they might stalk their, uh, their former partner. And that's not because they're evil. It's because they're desperate. They're terrified. And they don't have anywhere to land. 
And so that's, so that's how I, you know, I describe it in more lengthier terms than that, obviously, to clients. But that's not the way it's described on the internet. <laughs> the way it's described on the internet is they're, they're manipulative, they're into themselves, they have no empathy, and it's just like, my God, like, and some clinicians are even saying shit like that. It's like, you obviously have no idea what you're talking about. Um, it, it'd sort of be like, to me, while I'm on this soapbox, it'd be like saying, to, it, to describe someone with depression, with major depressive disorder, it'd be like describing them as they're manipulative, they're lazy, um, they just want everything brought to them on a silver platter. And it's like, well, maybe that's how it feels like to you because you lived with someone with depression. But certainly they're not doing it on purpose. <laughs> and certainly there's a reason why they're, they look lazy to you. It's because of, you know, this and this and that. And, but for some reason, when it comes to personality disorders, because they're, it's just so misunderstood. And I also think some disorders somehow tap into some, I don't know, some common uh, things that we like to beat people up about, beat, beat other people up about. Anyway. Also, join us on Facebook and Instagram, mainly Facebook. Um, our We have two pages on Facebook mainly. We got our main page. And we also have the fan group. On the fan group, you can post anything you want. On the on our Facebook page, that's where I do most of my, most of my announcements. And so if you want to learn about what we're doing on the podcast, like sometimes we do special things and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, go to Facebook. If you want to talk to me, only contact me through the us on the website. So go to psychologyinseattle.com, go to the Contact Us page, contact me through there. Also, for, if you don't know, we are on YouTube Live, often me and Umberto, or just me, Thursdays, 2 p.m. Seattle time. So join us on YouTube where I, we just, you know, we, we got the webcams set up and the microphones and we, we chat with you. And as listeners, you or watchers, you ask questions of us. I don't know. How, I don't know the talk. I don't know how this things, these things work. But anyway, if you want, act, we've made almost a thousand episodes and we're going to do our thousand, we're going to do our thousandth episode celebration, I think in December of 2019. And if, so we, on your phone, if you listen to the podcast on your phone, you probably only have access to the last one to 300 episodes. We've made a lot of great episodes prior to, you know, 300 episodes ago. So if you want to access those, go to our archive on the website. The website is the only place that has all the archive at this point. In the future, we want to change that, but the technology doesn't really exist yet. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that I'm starting to do, if you haven't noticed, reruns on Sundays. So I'm kind of picking good episodes from the past anyway and sort of recycling them into the feed. Um, yeah, okay. So that's that's all that. Let's read an email. Anonymous patron, or no, patron Marie writes, I am a psychology undergrad, undergrad student. I am loving my courses in psychology and my degree requires me to do certain compulsory units. So I chose to take a course on the history and philosophy of science. As a student, I've always been self-conscious about whether I'm smart or not, and I'm still working on feeling like an imposter at my university. I have a tendency when learning to think that things are more complicated than they actually are, and then completely misunderstanding the tasks, especially when I have a teacher that makes me feel uneasy and anxious. I get, uh, see, I, I see there's this class that has a tutor that seems to be really nice. I think tutor is like a teaching assistant or something. However, every time I put my hand up to contribute something, she tells me that I am wrong. This, this made me feel weird because the teachers I've had in other classes are more subtle and encouraging when we miss the mark on something. She also kept going on about how to write our papers, which is helpful, but she also kept saying things like, I've read so many bad papers, blah, blah, blah. And I feel like she focuses on how people are getting things wrong so much more than telling us what a good example is. I felt like there was something off about her. And so I Googled her and I found her Twitter account. And I found that she was tweeting about how she couldn't believe we got a simple concept wrong and we didn't even bother to Google the concept. 
I actually did that exercise that she was referring to, and she gave me a zero on it, and I did try hard on it. I felt quite bad reading that tweet of hers. What was she? Uh, what was the reaction she was expecting from people on Twitter? Did she think people would agree with her that we were all stupid people? It's her job to guide us so we don't make mistakes like that, right? Later, my friend asked her if she knew who Jordan Peterson was because he really likes him. By the way, I'm not a particular fan of Jordan Peterson, but she said that she didn't like him and she gave some reasons. Then later, after class, she tweeted about how he asked her about Jordan Peterson and how she couldn't hide her negative opinion of him. It just seems off. It seems like it wasn't coming from a good place. I just thought, is it necessary to tweet things like that? To tweet about what goes on in your class like that? I know, Kirk, you talk about stuff that goes on in your class on the podcast, but I can tell it comes from a place of compassion. Uh, The thing I like about you the most is that you're never afraid to admit your faults, and I think that's a great quality in a leader. End of email. Well, thank you, Patreon Marie. That's nice of you to say. Uh, I think um, teachers should be that way. I I don't think there's anything special about me. I'm just going to say I hate this person. I hate this teacher you're you're referring to. I don't know her. I don't know the story. I haven't seen the tweets myself, but uh, I... I have a lot of feelings about people like this. So I don't know if what I'm about to say applies to your teacher, but if if it's any if this teacher is who I think she is, I've seen this sort of person before and I hate people like this. People like this should be fired immediately. When I was a program director, if I saw a tweet like this, I would immediately fire them. No questions asked. I'd be like, "You're done." Because publicly ridiculing your students for not knowing things. It's your responsibility as a teacher to teach things. So if your students don't know things, it's your fault. And that's how I always see it. When my student, when, when I, especially if it's a, if, if I see in a lot of students last quarter, I taught a brand new class on couple therapy. I'd never taught it before. And so I was still working out some of the, some of the kinks and I, Got all the, you know, it's all papers. It's no tests So at my university. So halfway through the quarter, I got, everyone wrote a paper. I get, you know, 15 papers and I'm reading them. And I start seeing these consistent mistakes that, I don't know, about half the students were making, maybe a third. My conclusion, now in the moment, I'm like, oh, like it's frustrating as a teacher. I get that frustration where you're just like, oh, like these students, they didn't learn this thing that I wanted them to learn. And it taps into this deep insecurity that all teachers have. Believe me, I can tell you about that. And I know it's universal. Every, every instructor I talk to has deep insecurities, even you know, people like me who have been teaching for 20 years. It's uh, like if a client thinks I'm a terrible therapist, that hurts my feelings. But if a student thinks I'm a terrible instructor, that destroys me. <laughs> Because I, I don't know why it just it it just is it's it's so I think school care you know we start school at the age of like four or something so I think it, we just regress to this early place it, there's just so much at stake in terms of our personality and self worth with school but anyway so I get it you know you're looking at your papers and you're like oh man you know these people didn't get it but I immediately say okay well I have a there's a why in the road. I can blame the students and be like, what a bunch of dumb shits. Or I could assume that these are smart, able, enthusiastic people, and I just didn't teach it well enough. Now, I don't have to beat myself up about it. I don't have to cry myself to sleep at night. But I could say, huh, that must be a, that must be a topic that I didn't give enough time in class. So I'm going to make that a point. The next time we meet, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I lecture f- about this for another half an hour and really make sure that those who didn't get it the first time I talked about it, they're given an opportunity to get it the second time. And, and w- that usually works. Uh, people are, are trying to do well. Students, they're trying. And so if, if there's, especially as, you know, the example that this um, – patron Marie talks about where many of the students are getting it wrong, then the only answer is it's the teacher's fault. 
Again, you don't have to cry yourself to sleep, but you do have to say, huh, the way I taught this obviously was not effective. So, so that's just support. Now, if you're teaching a, a bunch of 13 year olds who hate being in school, then it's not so much on your head. But in my position where I'm teaching graduate students who are adults, average age is, I don't know, 35, and they're all paying thousands of dollars just to take my class. I think, I think to take just my class is something like two or $3,000. I don't know. And it, they're trying. Now, undergraduate students are also probably trying pretty hard. You might have some who aren't trying very hard. That's fine too. But I also blame instructors for that too. Good instructors can motivate even unmotivated people to learn. You put, it, like in an undergraduate class, you get half the students are enthusiastic and the other half aren't. A good instructor can motivate many of those unmotivated students. It's a matter of making the material compelling. It's a matter of having enthusiasm. It's a matter of having compassion. It's a matter of being creative. It's a matter of constantly innovating your teaching style. I've been teaching this one class called Family of Origin for 20 years, 20 plus years. The first time I taught it was in 97. Yeah. So it's 22 years. Every time I teach this class, I'm changing it. I've been teaching. I, I don't know how many times I've taught the class. I've taught it, you know, dozens of times. And I'm still changing it. And years ago, I said to myself, why am I continuing to change this class when students love the class as it is? You know, the first or probably the third time I taught the class, students were like, this is the best class I ever took or, you know, whatever nice things people say <laughs> to their instructors on their, you know, anonymous evaluations. Um, and I was like, huh, okay, I've nailed it. I don't, I, I, I figured out the curriculum. I figured out my approach. Don't change it or else you might mess it up. Well, I'm constantly changing it because it's important to innovate. And once you kind of get in this rut, I think things go downhill. And so you, so I'm all, so I'm making work for myself because I just think it's important to stay fresh. I also kind of get bored with doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, also, you know, things change over time, you know, different ideas come into our field. You got to incorporate that. Anyway, my point is, is that, um, I hate this person that you're talking about. I hate people like this. I think they should be fired. If I saw a tweet like this and I was program director, I would fire someone like that. Ridiculing your students. Um, you know, I hate it when people do this in private conversations. So there's two situations that I run into professionally where this happens. One is, is among fellow profession, uh, professors, well, there'll be some people who will have this kind of attitude toward their students. I luckily don't work with a lot of instructors like this, but I have in the past. The other venue is I'll be in a room full of therapists and they'll start talking about their clients in a very negative way. And even in those situations where the, where the clients and the students can't hear what's happening, it bothers me there too. Um, but to tweet about it, I mean, my God, you know, what's wrong with it's does she not think that some of her students aren't going to come across that? Like, it's just deplorable. Now, again, I get where it comes from. Like I said, we're all deeply insecure. She sounds particularly ins insecure. So she bullies others to make herself feel better. I get it. And I feel bad for her. And I hope she gets the help that she needs. But I would still fire her. And there's probably a, a university policy about this. And I would look into that, uh, patron Murray. I would look into... Is this instructor breaking some sort of policy? Because you might want to report her. This is an absolutely reportable offense. And I guarantee you her boss would like to know about this bullshit. It's also possible that it's a FERPA violation. So if you don't know about FERPA, essentially students have confidentiality in the same way that uh, clients do. And for a instructor to tweet about particular conversations they're having in their classrooms it's probably not strictly a FERPA violation because it doesn't identify any particular student, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just guessing that the university has some sort of policy about that. And like I said, I've always been against this sort of attitude. Um, I see it among therapists sometimes talking shit about their clients behind their backs. Again, I get it. Being a teacher is stressful. Being a therapist is, is stressful. 
Some, cli- some clients even attack us. Some students attack us. It's rare, but it happens. But to me, if you can't take it to the point where you're tweeting about it, then you need to get out of the profession. You need to be removed or you need to quit. Go do some job where it, it doesn't matter. You know, go work at Microsoft and maybe you have a bunch of customers, vendors, or coworkers that you hate. You know, feel free to tweet about that. That's fine. Um, therapists have a moral obligation to find compassion and understanding. And so do professors. Professors and therapists, particularly, you know, in certain fields, you have a moral obligation to find compassion and and understanding. And to not have that to the point where you're actually uh, on purpose tweeting to the entire world that you believe your students or your clients are stupid or something indicates that you do not have that value of returning to compassion and understanding. You know, I tell my students this, and I've talked about this in the podcast before, but I guess I should talk about it in this context is I tell students, look, before you decided to become a therapist, you could be a regular human. You decided to become a therapist. You can now not be a normal human. If you, if you want to be a normal human, then, then get out of the profession now. And what I mean by that is you need to have compassion for everyone doesn't mean you need to like everyone or hang out with everyone or forgive everyone, but you have to have compassion and understanding for literally every human being on the planet. Now, sometimes people say like, what, I'm supposed to be, I'm supposed to have compassion for Hitler or Pol Pot or something. And it's like, okay, fine. If you happen to run across a Pol Pot or a Hitler, then, you know, feel free to disregard this, this statement. But uh, certainly when you have students who are making mistakes, you need to have understanding and compassion for those people. Certainly when you have a client who is a Republican and voted for Trump and you hate Trump, you need to have compassion and understanding for that person in the same way you'd have compassion for anyone else. Before you were a therapist, you could hate your political rivals. Before you were a professor in psychology in particular, you could... You could, you could refuse to understand other people and refuse to have compassion for your fellow human being. Now that you're a therapist, now that you're a professor, those days are over. You chose this field. You chose to be a helper of humans. You chose to be in a field where you are in contact with human beings that depend on you to have compassion and understanding. There are other professions, most, most professions, do not require you to have compassion and understanding for all human beings. So go do that. No problem. Uh, physicians, teachers, religious ministers, social workers, I would even argue politicians, all of which you could have done anything. If, if you're that privileged that you can become a teacher, a doctor, a minister, a social worker, a politician, a therapist, professor, you're a privileged individual to begin with. With that privilege, you could have done a lot of things. And if if you're going to point that privilege at one of the helping professions, then you can't be a regular human anymore. You have to be a compassionate, understanding person. Now, you're going to lose your compassion sometimes. You're going to lose your understanding sometimes. I have. We all do. But you got to return to it. You certainly have to return to it before you start fucking tweeting. Again, I get it. I have countertransference too. I get angry and frustrated too with students and clients. But after I vent a little bit or think about it for three seconds, I return to compassion and love because otherwise I'm going to harm society and, or I'm going to burn out of this profession, which isn't good for me or them. Plus, I just want to say, and I've talked about this before, compassion and love and understanding that position is much more of a peaceful place to live. It's honest, it's real, it's authentic. It's, I don't know other, other words to say, grassroots, like I'm in contact with realness. When I see Donald Trump's narcissism, which is motivated by his deep sadness that he never shows, but I can see it, I feel like I'm connecting with Donald Trump on a fundamental human level instead of this uh, t- other level. And again, if I wasn't a therapist, I could hate Donald Trump. I don't like his politics. I don't like the way he presents himself. I know some of you voted for Donald Trump and, you know, it's fine. 
you probably hate, you know, many uh, Democratic people, <laughs> politicians. I don't know. It's just the bias of the political landscape we're in, but or objective truth, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> but anyway, when I see him, uh, I see someone who is hurting. Uh, let's just do Bill Clinton. He's far enough in the in the past. Bill Clinton uh, has problems, and in the Me Too movement, he would have been shredded. Uh, I would assume, and he. Uh, was very problematic and did very horrible things. But I can see the damage that he must have incurred growing up. And I can see his pain and I can see his, I can see a, it's like he's a lost little boy to me. Now I separate that from how I vote I'm not, I'm not going to vote for people just because I have compassion for the human being. I'm going to vote based on how I feel like they're going to legislate. So, so there are two different things. Just because I can have compassion for a politician doesn't mean I'm going to vote for them. So anyway, it, it's so, it's so much, it's so, I'm, I feel so much more at peace when I can understand people. Forget about politicians. Just think about people in your own life. Just people that that person who cuts you off on the freeway and flips you off, that coworker who never says anything nice to you, that child of yours who never gives you appreciation, that parent of yours who never shows that they're pr proud of you, that sibling of yours who criticizes everything you do. I can see that in the typical way, which is to say, oh, you know, they're an asshole, blah, blah, blah. But when I can see through the surf, the the veil of hostility that they have, and see the the pain behind that. I have compassion for them, and I feel like I'm connecting to the universe in this fundamental way, like I'm grounded in a way. And it, you know, is so much more optimistic <laughs> when I see the love that everyone is giving each other all the time today, which is what I see. I feel good about the future. I feel good about today. I just feel a lot better. I have compassion for this instructor who tweeted, you know, denigrating things about you and your classmates. I understand her. I think I understand people like her, I think in general, uh, but I'd still fire her. All right. Well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thanks for joining me out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really, really do. And take care of other people, please.